I didn't know philosophy of science was such a hit. I was more like four people when I was at the university. Um, so the, the, this talk is uh, sort of came from the last two years, last year of my, of my PhD, which I was doing in sort of theoretical computer science. And towards the end of the PhD, I was thinking, hmm, what is it that I'm actually doing here? Which is, I think all, all PhD students think the same thing. Um, but I tried to turn it into another interesting topic. And I started wondering, when we do computer science, what are sort of the, the, the things that we work with? We always, I don't know, we can give some definitions. We work with them. We are doing some mathematics. But what is the sort of goal? Like, what's, what's the idea behind what we, are, what we are trying to do? And I think types are a really nice example where you, can, where you can think about it. Because when you think, what is a type? Um, you can read a paper that says type is tau, and there's primitive types alpha, or there's functions tau to tau, and that's types. Done. And then they, you can wonder what are types for, and then they'll tell you types give you soundness. And uh, that's what we write in the papers, but when you sort of look around and go to conferences and talk to people about types, then they will say something completely different. So, um, ah, I'll get an yep. even better mic. <laughs> okay. So, what are types? What are they good for? And I think if you, if you read some papers on types, then they'll have some answers, but that just doesn't correspond to what I sort of think about when I talk about types in F-sharp talks or when I see talks about types in conferences. And so um, I had a look at the, at the types lecture at the University of Cambridge where there's like first slide where they tell you types are really good um, and they're useful for detecting errors via type checking, uh, they support structuring of large systems. They give you documentation efficiency and whole language safety. And then from the second slide, it's like Greek letters. Um, and I think there's this sort of interesting thing that happens where we start with the overall motivation and then we talk about some mathematics. Um, also, when you, when you think about these, so this is at Cambridge and they probably had types lectures since 1908. Um, so uh, okay, no, in 1908 it probably wasn't about documentation and efficiency. But it's, if, you, if you read these and you think about some of the new programming languages that are appearing, like if you say TypeScript or Dart, um, they don't give you whole language safety because from a theoretical perspective they're actually not safe. Uh, somehow it doesn't bother the people who use them. Uh, they don't give you efficiency because they just erase to JavaScript and then JavaScript does some magic to run things fast. Um, yeah, I think like TypeScript is primarily sort of appeared for structuring of large systems and documentation. Sometimes it detects errors, sometimes it doesn't. Um, so there's a lot of things that sort of appear that really don't quite match the, the, the thing that we say to our students in the first lecture. Uh, it's first lecture, so they don't really listen, and then they, they don't complain, so it's okay. But um, So what I'd like to do here is, there's, there's two parts. In the first part, I want to uh, say a few things about history. Um, it's actually more of an archaeology. So I'm just going to pick a few random cases from history where people talked about types or something related to types happened. Um, to illustrate the different sort of contexts in which people think about it. So it's not really, like, I'm not trying to tell you what are types, I just want to give you a couple of uh, historical episodes where something related to type happened, and I also want to look at, not at sort of what we now know about things that happened then, but what the, were the people actually thinking when they were saying the things. And I think in, in computer science, we have this uh, bad habit where we look at something that happened 50 years ago and we're like, oh yeah, they're talking about programming and this is just like web browser. Um, 
when the concepts that people were originally using when thinking about stuff were just completely different and didn't match anything we do these days. Um, and then I'll have a bit of philosophical reflection where I'll sort of use some of the episodes to illustrate interesting ideas. So the origins of types, uh, there's Bertrand Russell. Um, if you want to buy the, the, the picture that I tweeted, there's really nice t-shirts with like lots of weird philosophy shirts. So you can, you can get his uh, picture with sm smoking pipe. Um, so he was interested in the foundations of logic. So he's a mathematician and there's this problem in foundations of logic when you say a class of all classes that do not contain themselves as an element. That's a, that's a paradox and the logicians back then didn't really know like what do we do with it because does it mean that all our logic is broken and we can't even say anything because it doesn't make any sense. Um, and then he sort of, when, when Bertrand Russell came up with the idea of types, he was using types to avoid these sort of paradoxes. And then uh, some years later, Alonzo Church um, took the lambda calculus, which was another theory, and added types to lambda calculus. Um, and when you read the old paper, it's actually really interesting because he's saying, well, so type theory is this foundations of mathematics thing, and there's another foundations of mathematics things called lambda calculus, and what would happen if we added types there? And he's not saying like types are useful for error checking or anything. He's not saying types are useful for this, this allowing invalid programs. He's just saying, well, it's an interesting theory. Let's try to combine them and see what happens. Um, and they were, they were really all talking about foundations of mathematics and in Russell's uh, types, he had uh, some base formulas uh, and he called them type zero. And then if you have a formula that talks about another formula, it will have type n plus one. Uh, so you can distinguish between formulas that talk about some basic things and formulas that talk about other formulas. So that was, that was his way of avoiding the paradox because he was saying, when I say I am lying, the sort of self-referential nature, it doesn't actually refer to the original term. It refers to, so what, I, what I'm doing here is like I'm, I'm stepping outside and I'm getting one level higher. So it's, uh, he was using types as a, as a way to sort of structure the, the logic so that you avoid this, this kind of problem. Um, now, there's one really interesting thing that I found when I, was, when I was looking at this, because what they always say, so this is from uh, Bertrand Russell, who says, it's unnecessary to know what objects belong to the lowest type. So he doesn't care if it's like numbers or if it's, I don't know, strings or system.datetime. Uh, for him, it's sort of a, a formalism to structure some terms, but he's not saying what the types actually are. And Alonso Church also says similar thing, where when he has some, some basic types, he refrains from making more definite the nature of the types, because again, for him, it really doesn't matter what they are. And I think it's, it's really interesting when you go back to the history to sort of see this, because suddenly people are not talking about types in the same way we are. When I read the paper and I know programming, I can read it as imagining they're talking about sets of values and it's just like integer or it's just like string. But when you sort of try to go back and unthink what we now know, they really were not thinking that types are some sets of values. So um, that's, I think, one, one really interesting bit where Types, even though we, we refer to lambda calculus when we talk about types in functional programming, uh, there's this subtle change where something that was really more of a formal structure evolved into something that now has a meaning and it usually denotes, like integer denotes one, two, three, four, five, and so on. So that's one interesting bit. The other really interesting bit, so this was the, the sort of logic side of the world. And now we get into the imperative, like real people doing computers. Um, so 
uh, I think the first the first use of the term type uh, in when talking about something that you might call more like a data type, uh, there's actually a nice essay by Stephen Kell, who's sort of distinguishing between types as in logic and types as in like memory data type. So the first use of the, ter of the term uh, type was in Algol 58, and they actually, before, before uh, one meeting that happened in 1958 in Zurich, uh, in the specification, they were saying a data symbol, so that's like a value or a variable, falls in one of the following classes. It's integer, or it's Boolean, or it's general. Uh, so they were actually, before the meeting, they were using classes, and uh, something happened at the meeting. Uh, we don't quite know what, but after the meeting, the, the specification was saying types. and. Uh, there's there's paper from uh, Simon Martini who's tried to find out what happened, and he says, "Well, I don't really know. Like, it looks like they just renamed it from classes to types, probably because they thought it's a better name. So, if you don't know anything about programming, uh, there's nothing like types in your world. That's actually sort of nice word to use for this this thing you just added to your uh, to your Algol 58." So uh, what, what Simon is saying is it's quite remarkable that it really looks like when they put the word types in Algol, it was not related to logic in any way. They just picked it because it was a nice word. Um, so this is how types sort of appear in logic and appear in Algol and possibly Maybe someone heard about some work and thought, oh, that's a nice name they're using there, let's, let's do it too. Uh, but there really wasn't sort of any strict relationship. And then, um, I guess the, the, the two sort of started coming back when um, John McCarthy and then later it was more refined by Tony Hoare, um, looked at the programming and their sort of more, more theory, f more theory uh, focused people than the, the hackers putting together Algol. Now Algol people were, were actually fairly theoretical as well, but this is sort of a, a late reflection where they started thinking, so what do these types that we have in Algol, uh, what do they actually mean? And this is where I think there's, there's one interesting step that happened where uh, Hoare developed McCarthy's theory, who sort of started modeling data types in programming languages as some sets of values. So this happened much later, it's something like 70s, where we actually started, where the idea that types represent set of possible values, where that idea appeared. Before, in logic, they were formal constructs. In programming, they were probably just bits or something in, in whatever memory or like holes in your punch cards. Um, so this is where one really interesting concept appeared. Uh, there's a nice book that, that talks about a lot of the early computing history, science of operations. So if you want to read something about how things happened, that's a good source. Uh, but you might think that this idea of types as sets of values, this is where we should stop, and now uh, we figured it out. But it's actually more complicated. Um, so if you look at languages where uh, they're, not, they're not pure, they allow some sort of mutation, and it could be, be F-sharp where you can just mutate things, it could be Haskell where you have to use some monads to mutate things. Um, but in some sense, they, you sort of introduce the, the idea of mutation in there. And then, um, so this is an example from um, sort of languages where you have something called effect systems. So effect system, on the red, on the left, it says, I have memory references, uh, R and S, and they're allocated in some memory regions. And when I do the assignment, the type system, so in F-sharp, the type system will tell you it's unit. I don't know what it does, it probably mutates something. Uh, in Haskell, it will tell you it's a monad. Um, in languages with effect systems, it will tell you the type of this operation, of this assignment, 
is unit, meaning it doesn't return anything, and this annotation that says it actually also writes the this bit of memory and reads from that bit of memory. So it's more, it's just another way of sort of talking about what your programs do when they run. Um, and it's uh, interesting programming language theory that in some way is, is corresponds, to, corresponds to monads. Uh, but the really interesting thing from the sort of philosophical perspective here, if you look at the type unit and uh, write to one region, read from another region, what does that mean? What does it represent? Does it represent some set of values? Well, maybe, I don't know. In Haskell, you could model it as set of functions that take the whole world and produce another world, but that's really cumbersome way of, of describing what it is, because once you have sets of all functions that do something, it becomes quite complicated. So there's, there's another proposal that's uh, fairly recent, um, where the idea is no types are not sets. That's wrong. Types are actually relations. So um, you're sort of specifying some relation where when you say I read from uh, memory, or when I just say I read, I write to this bit of memory, your relation is some relation between the, the previous world and the new world where if I change any bit of memory in the input that's not the one I'm reading, then it doesn't change the result. So it's just another sort of, I think this is like 2010 or, or, or so, fairly new idea where we are again thinking, well, actually, maybe types mean something else. And it goes more, uh, it goes even crazier if you look at some of the new programming languages that are appearing. So I talked about effects and monads. Then you have things like Dart and TypeScript where they're not really sound, so the type sort of means, well, it could be this, maybe. Um, there's languages that are dependently typed, are, are very much based in the theory world, and uh, there the, the types mean, again, something very different. They're actually more like the full specification of your program, and the way the people in, that, in these communities use, use, lang use types is very different than the way, say, TypeScript people use types. But there are some interesting overlaps because, for example, uh, a lot of the cool editor features that people sort of started doing in Java, now if you look at, um, I think, the Emacs mode for Idris, it uses types in Idris to do lots of clever editor, editor things, even though it's a completely different idea of types. And then you have things like F-sharp type providers where they're rooted in this, in this logical background, but then they do weird things, like your type suddenly, your type system is perfectly sound and nice and logical, except that it can uh, depend on the internet. So your program type checks if you're connected to the internet, if you're not connected to the internet, or if your external data source changes, you're no, no, wrong, no longer uh, able to compile. So that's even though it's rooted in the logical approach, it added something that a lot of people will find really weird, um, especially the more logical, logical background people, but it's actually something that fits pretty well with the programming language, but you have to look at it, at the, you have to look at it a bit differently. So I think that the key message for the first part is it doesn't look like we're getting closer to any sort of clear, precise definition. And the second part of the talk is, it doesn't matter. Uh, so the second part, um, there's, uh, there's a lot of, lot of interesting literature on philosophy of science or philosophy of mathematics. Um, I think if you got intrigued by Phil Wadler's question whether things are discovered on or invented, you should read something about philosophy of mathematics because that's like the, the biggest problem in the whole field. Uh, of course, people can solve it on Twitter, but I don't think they will capture the full complexity of the topic. Um, so I'll just have a look at a couple of different ideas from philosophy of science. And this is, this is something that's been around for a long, long time in some way. So this is a picture of Francis Bacon. As you can see from his uh, 
from his clothes. Uh, he's not very modern. This is uh, in 17th century. And Francis Bacon is actually known as the sort of father of the scientific method. And he, in, he describes a couple of ideas or a couple of things that people do wrong uh, when they try to be thinking precisely in a, in a scientific way. They didn't quite have the word back then. But when you try to think precisely, one common, and he calls this idols, uh, the idol of tribe is that the human intellect easily supposes a greater order and equality in things that then there actually is. So um, I think this, this definitely fits to types, because when we think about types, we think, oh yeah, types are these precise, formal, nice things. But if you look around, well, actually, they're kind of messy. Um, the other one is idols of the market, where the confusions of language, uh, one and the same name being applied indifferently to things that are not of the same nature. Uh, I think I talked about this before. So types, the, the, the name just appeared from two different contexts and we meshed it together and now we think it's actually one nice elegant thing. So I think there's, there's a lot you can, you can learn if, even if you go to people who were talking about scientific method in 17th century. They got it, they figured it out. Uh, the, other, the other really interesting person, and now we are at the beginning of the 20th century. Um, so Paul Feyerabend has this approach called epistemological anarchism, um, where um, if, you, if you asked Paul, Paul Feyerabend, so Paul, should there be a clear definition of what a type is? He would say, well, he wouldn't just say no, because he's a philosopher. So he says, to clarify the terms does not mean to study the additional properties of the domain in question. It means to fill them with existing notions from the entirely different domain of logic. So what he's saying here is when someone asks you to clarify something, it's not that they would want you to sort of go into a cave and think about it for a, lot, for a lot more and then come up with something that's clearer. Usually when you clarify things, it means you have to explain it in the terms that are currently well understood. So it doesn't mean you have this like nice little idea somewhere that's a bit weird. You don't study the idea more. You're trying to fit it onto the things that are already out there. And rather than actually investigating it, different interesting things around here, what you're doing is that you're just fitted onto the well-known things and you're not asking questions that are relevant here, you're actually asking questions that are relevant in this well-established domain. So uh, when you come up with, with something weird, people will ask you, so give us the formal system. And uh, you're like, well, that doesn't really work, I don't know, maybe, yeah. Okay, well, if I change it like this, so that that interesting bit is sort of moved away because it was breaking stuff, then I can give you a formal system. So, Feyerabend is sort of advocating something that many people perceived as anti-scientific, where uh, he was very much advocating for the sort of freedom of thinking, of thought, um, and many people think he's going a bit too far, but I think there's a, there's a lot of interesting points you can learn there where when you try to clarify something, often it means you actually just fit it into well understood area and forget the questions that were breaking it. So that's one interesting thought. And another one, uh, Imre Lakatos. Um, so this is, this is again sort of, um, Imre Lakatos and Paul Feyerabend were actually, uh, actually pretty close friends, and Lakatos was trying to add a bit of order to what, what Feyerabend was saying. And what he came up with was, was this idea that science is uh, basically consists of multiple competing research programs, where every research program covers a sort of group of people informally who, ha who share the same assumptions. So every research program has some hard core, which is what we believe, and that's what we'll nev never question. And then there's stuff around that we can fiddle with. 
Um, so, for example, if you talk to Haskell people and you tell them, well, actually, if you do a, if you instead of using immutable map, if you use a hash table, mutable hash table, then it will be faster. And they'll tell you, well, no, no, that's wrong, that's silly. You can't use mutation. But they have, because that's their, that's their hardcore assumption, you just don't mutate. But they will tell you, but, and that's the auxiliary assumptions, we could have a compiler that's smart enough to figure out how to compile your immutable code into something that under the cover does mutation. And uh, that's their sort of way of dealing with the problem. So when you look at any group of people who have certain beliefs about types, they will always have some hardcore assumptions, which is, I'm never going to question this. Type system must be sound. Uh, and if you have type system where programs that are type checked will fail, that's total rubbish, that's completely wrong. Or you can have people who will say, well, type system primarily have to be useful for doing good editor tools. And if your type system just doesn't work in that way, like you can't build anything useful for your IDE, then that's not, that's like, why, why bother? Um, so I think there's, there's really nice idea here where you have these different people coming from different backgrounds with sort of different hardcore assumptions and uh, they have different ideas about what types are for. Uh, also, when they talk together, it, it becomes interesting because they just don't believe what the other, they, they don't understand that the other person just doesn't want to add a, make the type system not safe because that's their hardcore assumption. Um, so the hardcore assumptions are never blamed for any apparent failure uh, and we always find a way to describe, well, actually, I don't have to compromise on this hardcore assumption. I can come up with some other, other excuse. Um, Lakatos has another really interesting idea, which is when uh, the sort of meaning of something slightly shifts and evolves and changes. And he calls this concept stretching, and it's like when I, when I think about type systems and then someone comes with TypeScript and says, well, actually, our type system is not sound, but that doesn't really matter. Um, that's a new, really weird counterexample to something that existed before. And um, when you, once you learn about it, it's really hard to sort of ignore it and say, well, this is, this, uh, I don't know what to do with it. That's, that's weird. Um, but there's, uh, there's, People, um, so um, when, you, when you stretch the concept and Lakatosh is talking, he has this really nice book called Talking About Polyhedra. Polyhedra. Uh, when the stretching happens, it's sort of, what happens is that suddenly new things that are really weird are called polyhedra as well. So when you think of polyhedra, you have these nice, uh, nice objects and suddenly someone comes up with idea that polyhedra can have a tunnel through it. And it matches the definitions, but it breaks all the sensible rules. And so there's some, some shift in the meaning, and uh, the, the nice, uh, or, or what often happens is that people who sort of see this happening, they're like, well, no, this just this, this never happened. This is really bad. This is not a proper polyhedra. This is some weird monster. Um, and uh, there's, there's a beautiful example from Charles Hermit in 1893 where he says, I turn aside with a shudder of horror from this lamentable plague of functions which have no derivatives. When someone pointed uh, to Charles Hermit that actually there are functions that you can't uh, differentiate, he was like, no, doesn't, never. Um, and then eventually it took a couple of years and people got used to the idea and then they said, well, actually, blah, 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 here's some solution. Uh, but the initial, the initial reaction to something that's really weird that we learn to live with later on is this shudder of horror. So I have a little adaptation which is a, a fiction, but you could pretty much imagine this. Um, so someone on Hacker News could very well say, 
I turn aside with a shudder of horror from this lamentable plague of type systems which have no soundness proof when they read about TypeScript or Dart. Um, yeah, people on Hacker News actually don't have that poetic language, so I couldn't quote anything like actual, but there's, there's things in the same theme. Um, and the sort of last thing, going back again to Feierabend, where um, he, we are sort of going back to the question, so if this world is really like as messy as I'm saying, is there some correct scientific method? Like scientists, they discover truth and they tell us, they, they accumulate correct knowledge and discover truth. So what is the method? And um, Feierabend says, well, actually, if you look at the, at the history, so if you look at how important events in the history happened, uh, it's clear that there's only one principle that always can be applied, and that's anything goes. So, and he's not saying, so this is, this. He got, he got misunderstood quite often as saying, there's no order, you can do whatever. Um, he's not quite saying that. He's, he's saying, well, in different parts of history, people followed different methods, and uh, they always followed some methods, but there's no sort of universal method that always works. So if there's a bit of history, where people discover something really nice through theoretical programming language research by, I don't know, taking interesting ideas from model logic and turning them into, into programming language theory, which is what Phil Bodler was talking ab about in the morning. That's one method for doing things. But if you look at how things happened in the history, um, there's lots of other methods that actually created something interesting, something useful, and something that science now calls the truth. Um, so, is there, is there, uh, what can we do when, when we uh, can't come up with one universal sort of idea what a type is? Um, I think that the really the most important thing is to understand that that's not a problem. Uh, the, the other bit is to understand that there are these research programs where within a research program we have some method for doing things and that's fine, but it's worth looking at the other research programs that are around and do things differently and maybe try to understand why they're not subscribing to the same hardcore assumptions. Um, and I think it's also um, just interesting to think about the fact that there's different people talking about types, and uh, we, can, we can do it even without sort of agreeing on one common definition. Because type is sort of a, a fluid concept that uh, exists in different worlds, means slightly different things, but it's still useful to have it as a shared concept, because sometimes you do something with types in one way, and you can actually port it into other, other research program or other space, and even though you're sort of not doing precisely the same thing as the people there, it will, it will work and it will be useful. So, uh, in, in summary, I just picked two, two really nice quotes uh, from uh, Feierabend and Lakatos to illustrate it. Uh, so one, uh, and this is from Feierabend who says, science is much more sloppy and irrational than its methodological image. So when you look at scientists, you, you see these people who acquire perfect, correct knowledge. Um, if you look a bit deeper or, or read, what, uh, read this nice book, Against Method, from Paul Feierabend, then you'll learn that actually the world is a lot more complicated. And uh, there's also, on the, on the sort of notion of having always precise answer, um, Feierabend says, having precise answers can actually hamper the growth of knowledge. And uh, Lakatos says def it can deflect the course of investigations into narrow channels of things already understood. So that's sort of the idea that when you do something that's really a bit different than uh, what is generally understood, it's actually okay to just ignore a uh, lot of things that are established as facts and live in the world where 
uh, it doesn't quite work because lots of early ideas start as something that's really weird and doesn't quite make sense uh, only until some years later when people find a way to reconcile it or fix all the little, little details. So the example that Feyerabend uses is actually uh, the heliocentric system invented by Galileo, where when Galileo first said that actually uh, all the planets are, lo are rotating around sun, it wasn't good science because it was, it was giving worse predictions. It didn't match with what was established. Um, and everybody just knew that that's not how it is. Um, yeah, Feyerabend talks about, about Galileo, but it was Copernicus was the one who mentioned it before. But Galileo is the one who's sort of well known for doing it in the, as a, having the scientific truth that he like, invented the telescope and knew that now it's finally better. But um, yeah, even back then, it just wasn't giving the giving better prediction, and uh, after Copernicus, Galileo, and for, like, he stick to the idea, and eventually he was able to come up with better predictions that made, made, this, made it through. All right, so that's all I have to say. Um, it's sort of based on three articles or essays that I wrote, so here's just links if you want to have a look and find the other references as well. Thank you. And I think we have some time for um, questions or tomatoes or apples or whatever you want to throw at me. Eggs. Hi. So in the context of what you said, what would you say or what do you think about attempts to cry, create some higher order abstractions that would be able to unify all of the methods and logic systems, whatever, like, for example, I know that some people try to do that with category theory. Yeah, so what, what do I think about people trying to come up with general abstractions that will capture everything? Um, so I think that's one research program. Uh, that's like one, one way of approaching the problem, but it's, it has some strong assumptions. It has the strong assumptions that you can actually do this. You can find general abstractions without uh, in some way without losing all the things that are um, unique when you, when you uh, do the abstraction. So it's sort of, it's, it's an interesting one research program, uh, but I don't think there's sort of, uh, I don't think there's, there's a way to sort of start within one, one research program or within one mindset and suddenly sort of escape and cover everything. So that's why all the sort of philosophy books, when you read them, why they rarely, or the, the, the ones that sort of try to talk about these questions, why they don't say, why they don't try to sort of formalize everything they're talking about, because the, the natural language that they're using or the sort of human thought that they're trying to, to give you is uh, like as, as good as we can get about talking things across multiple different areas. But when you sort of start with one method, you're never going to escape that uh, area delimited by one method. Thanks. Uh, hi, Thomas. So basically in the, in the research, you kind of focus on the Western philosophical and the Western point of, have, have you ever wander out a little bit further out and then have you seen an interesting concept coming from areas that maybe are not so focused on the you know computational uh, apl applications of types yeah so uh, i was i was definitely focused on the more western uh, both the sort of logical side of things and the philosophy of of side of things and that's just because i don't really like that's that's what i understood that's what i know that's what i'm familiar with um, I'm sure there's lots of lots of interesting ideas from other like schools of thought that would actually make a lot of sense here as well. Um, I just don't know about them yet. So I'm I'm really sort of curious if someone has a rel something that you think is relevant. I would definitely love to know about it. I think there's there's one uh, nice book by and that's sort of going into a bit random direction, but there's. Um, 
book called Economics of Good and Evil by Tomasz Sedlaczek uh, from Czech Republic. And he has, it's sort of a book about economics where he's trying to trace um, ideas from modern economics to things like ancient myths or ideas that appear in like ancient myths or the Bible or other really old texts. And I thought that was really interesting because it's sort of, again, trying to trace a, a relationship between things that you wouldn't normally, or in the modern thought, you wouldn't see them as related, but there's actually really interesting similarities and maybe some of the ideas would work there. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that this would, this would be an interesting thing to do about types or computer science as well. So I'm wondering if uh, having these unsound type system, is this uh, really a, a more practical thing rather than philosophical thing, yeah. right? I mean, it's like in mathematics, uh, compared to computer science, you don't really have the notion of time. How long does it take to calculate something? Mm -hmm. You know, who cares, right? Uh, and I think also mathematics doesn't have the concept of money, cost, right? How much does it cost? So in computer science, in, in programming, in practical programming, there's the question, you know, how many people do I have to hire and how long it will it take me to write the program, mm -hmm. right? And there is the option of writing, you know, less sound programs that, for instance, contain bugs. And we know that essentially all programs contain bugs. So the fact that you don't have a sound system is just another source of bugs. And how much money are we willing to spend to get rid of all the bugs, right? Yeah. And, it, and it depends on you know whether you are uh, designing a website, right? Where it, you know, if it doesn't work, no, no big deal, right? Or whether you are designing a nuclear reactor, right? Yeah. Or or, or a jet, yeah. right? Then maybe, or, or financial programs that can waste billions yeah. of dollars, and something yeah. like that. Maybe then you really want to have a sound type system because that eliminates a lot of yeah. possibilities so, for bugs, right? So I think that the sort of, the, what, I, what I, and it's definitely sort of slightly misleading here because both Dart and TypeScript are, uh, used for web where, in a sense, you're, it doesn't, doesn't matter that much. But um, I wouldn't, I, I don't actually sort of think that when they design it, they're thinking um, it's okay because it's just web. They're thinking, well, how do, you, how do you get correct software? Well, one way is we can prove it, the other is we do a lot of tests. And Yes, in, if you if you if you subscribe to the to the sort of theoretical uh, approach, then you would say, well, no, the only way to do correct things is to do proofs, um, and then it sort of depends. Like, is your specification actually correct? You're sort of shifting the bugs from one bit to another bit. So, um, I think, and I don't necessarily think that's what the TypeScript designers would tell you. But um, I think there's a sort of saying that, that proof is the, the only way to get correct software um, is something that many people would sort of believe in because they believe that mathematics is the way of getting to truth. Um, but equally, there's still room for, for getting things wrong and there's room for getting things wrong even when my type system isn't sound. Um, but yeah, there's there's definitely sort of different areas where it will shift what are my core assumptions. Uh, but I don't necessarily think that if I care for correctness, it sort of forces me to go in one direction. So, but that's a, that's a topic for probably a longer break discussion. So right here. Uh. Yeah. Uh, so excuse my ignorance, but when I think of philosophy of science, the first thing that comes to mind is Knuth. Yeah. And um, so what I was wondering is, in Knuth it usually turns out that, except for some rare ex exceptions, that most of science 
when they come up with new things, they have to figure out a way to explain and reconcile with what we already know, because yep. otherwise it won't be accepted by the entire community. Yeah. So I guess it's I guess it's sort of a philosophy question, but how do we deal with the fact that sometimes these things that seem messy, uh, how do we know that you're not just being crazy? How do we know that this is something that makes sense in the yeah. long run? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, if you, how do you know that you're not crazy? Well, Popper would tell you you have to come up with a falsifiable assumption and then you're not crazy. Um, nobody does it in computer science. Um, and Lakatos will tell you, uh, sorry, F Feierabend will tell you, well, you'll never know. Sometimes you seem crazy at the beginning and later on it turns out that you were not crazy. Um, I guess what's, what's interesting, so I didn't mention Kuhn because um, when he talks about research paradigms, he sort of says it's, it's something that covers the, the entire, the whole community, like everyone has some shared assumptions. Um, and he sort of does it when talking about physics using something like 300 years of history. And that's really hard to sort of apply to computer science where um, we just don't have that much history yet. So I don't quite know how to sort of apply Kuhn to this. Um, in, in, in practice, when you sort of, how do you know that something is a science? Well, it gets, ab gets accepted as a paper by other scientists. So, yeah, you're not crazy if you can write a paper that other scientists will think is not crazy. Uh, and you sort of, if you're doing something crazy, you have to find a way to sort of go as far as they will let you, wait a bit, and then go as far as they will let you again. All right. Okay, thank you. Thanks.